Hi. I'd like to talk to you a bit about biodiversity. Um, we've, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Even though we have uh, a huge obsession with technology, we're still intrinsically linked uh, to biodiversity. Biodiversity in ecosystems really give us a huge uh, amount of benefits. Uh, things like uh, clean water, clean air, pollination services uh, for crops, uh, and even the crops and, and food that we eat uh, comes from the biodiversity. If we were to make machines uh, that did all of those things, it would cost trillions and trillions of dollars, but we use a lot of those services for free. Yet we don't really know that much around some of the basic, basic building blocks uh, of biodiversity. So if I just give you an example, uh, with water, we know quite a bit about water. We know that it rains. <laughs> we know that water flows downhill. We know that water uh, is a, a limited and finite resource, and we try, to, uh, we try to manage that. With biodiversity, for example, we probably don't know how many species there are on Earth. In a famous study uh, in, um, undertaken by the Smithsonian Institute in Panama, uh, all the insects uh, from 20 trees were collected, and they turned up more than uh, 1,200 different species of beetles, and 80% of those were new to science. Now, best estimates of the numbers of species on Earth are somewhere between 2 million and 100 million. You know, we don't even know <laughs> within two orders of magnitude how many species we've got on Earth. We've probably got about 10 million. I mean, if I was to make a guess, we've probably got about 10 million species. Um, and, um, yeah, species have huge importance for, for people. In, in China, for example, of the 25,000 uh, plant species in China, about a quarter of those are either eaten or used in medicine. And the naming of species is important to uh, every single culture on Earth. If we use uh, a species, we name it. Uh, but the taxonomic and uh, scientific naming of species started with Carl Linnaeus uh, in about the 1750s. Guess how many species we've named over 250 years? Guess how many species we actually know? Any guesses? A million. We've named about one million species. We've got 10 million, or maybe even 100 million to go. Over 250 years, we've probably named and found about 10% of uh, the biodiversity on Earth. At that current rate, it's gonna take us 2,000 years to complete uh, knowing the species on Earth. That's pretty poor. We're gonna need some help with that. And um, on the other side, the rate of extinction is increasing. Here in Australia, we've got the poorest uh, record uh, for species extinction. There have been dozens of mammal extinctions uh, here over the last 200 years. At current rates, many of those species are going to go extinct before we even know uh, they exist. Now, there is uh, some help at hand, uh, at least for that species discovery. It comes in the shape of genetics. Now, we know Moore's law as applied to computing. We know that the power of computing approximately doubles every 18 months. With sequencing and genetic technology, that power approximately goes up twofold or two orders of magnitude or 100 times uh, in an 18-month period. We've just seen a massive explosion in the amount of sequencing capacity and the amount of genetic capacity uh, that we can undertake. And this is partially due to projects like the Human Genome Project and various other uh, uh, projects of that nature. We can extract DNA from almost any living thing and a lot of dead things as well. Uh, where you couldn't do an identification of a species from a small uh, piece of leaf, or you couldn't do it from a broken eggshell, or you couldn't do it uh, from other, some other scrap of skin tissue, you can do it using DNA. So the power to uh, identify species using DNA uh, is uh, much more prevalent uh, than using other scientific techniques. At the moment, we use uh, large uh, machines that go ping. You know, it takes uh, you uh, about a week or so to, uh, to generate uh, the type of data uh, that are required uh, for that. But you get billions and billions of uh, genetic uh, codes uh, uh, from that type of uh, exercise. And that's increasing all the time. And also, this type of technology is miniaturizing. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, more rapid techniques. Uh, we, we've got almost a desktop uh, machine that can operate. And one day, maybe one day, we're going to get to Fox Tricorder, where you can put in a small piece of tissue, and it will tell you what the species is there and then. 
And that ability to identify species using genetics is called DNA barcoding, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and DNA barcoding is now a large international uh, endeavor, um, and uh, it's uh, received a lot of funding because of the potential applications of being able to identify and discover species uh, using genetics. We can use that type of information to value species. We can use it to place a conservation context on those species. We can actually use that type of uh, uh, data to, to track species that are traded. Is it the species that you think you've bought? Is it the plant and animal you think you're eating uh, that it says on the label? And also we can use this technology and increasing technology to undertake much more rapid survey to get us much more quickly to the answer, how many species do we have on Earth? So if we look at biodiversity conservation, first of all, this is some work uh, that was undertaken uh, in, in the wet tropics uh, here in Australia. Uh, the wet tropics in Australia is the only rainforest location in Australia, a massive rainforest in the Amazon uh, rainforest, but we just have a, a little small piece uh, that exists in northeast Queensland. There are some uh, 2,500 uh, plant species that exist in that tropical rainforest. And using DNA barcoding, we can go in without the knowledge of which species there, collect the plants, and then cluster them uh, using uh, uh, sequence data. And we actually get 95% of the species clusters correct using DNA barcoding without knowing what species they are. We can then apply the species to the genetic clusters uh, afterwards. We can also use that information that's there uh, within the genetics to reconstruct the evolutionary history and the ev evolutionary distance between species. Uh, this is um, uh, an example of a phylogenetic tree, which is a, a relationship between those species. And we can use that information to then value the community. The red areas there are those areas which have the most evolutionary diversity, and those areas are the areas which we, sh we should be con uh, conserving. Incidentally, those are areas where plants and animals have almost remained unchanged since the, the time of the dinosaurs. Um, uh, yet much more uh, uh, recent uh, invasions of plants and animals have come in uh, from Asia. But that's another story. But we can get those types of stories uh, out of this type of genetic data. Second example is uh, to look at the source uh, of products that we get. You know, is it, the, um, <laughs> uh, is it tuna uh, on the menu or is it dolphin? Um, so using an example from, uh, uh, well, this is uh, uh, King Henry VIII's uh, flagship, the Mary Rose, which was a Tudor warship. It sank off the, close, uh, the coast of England in uh, 1545 and was actually recovered in 1991. Um, we were sent some, um, <laughs> uh, some chunks uh, uh, of uh, the, the timbers that had been used to construct uh, the ship, and we were actually able to get DNA uh, uh, out of those timbers. So that uh, timber has been lying on the sea floor for 450 years, but the DNA remains intact uh, in that material. You can get DNA out of a broad range of uh, materials. So you can use uh, uh, this type of DNA extraction uh, and genetic analysis uh, to then do uh, follow a range of uh, products. We know globally that illegal logging costs industry uh, about $26 billion. We're very concerned where our products come from. Um, this was a, another study uh, that was done on a high-value tropical timber called Mabao. It's used uh, for decking, and uh, the company that uh, uh, imports uh, this decking product was concerned that they didn't think that Mabao actually came from the, uh, the sustainably logged forest that it said on the certificate. Currently, uh, logs that come out of uh, rainforests have to have a certificate, they have to be shown to come from a particular area. Some of those areas are said to be sustainably managed, and they are managed uh, that way uh, in many cases. But it's very easy to substitute logs along that supply chain. So the analysis showed uh, that the, uh, the, the logs, the, the timber product that came out of, uh, or, or was being imported by that importer, didn't actually come from eastern Papua, uh, where it said on the, um, uh, on the supply chain documentation, but actually came from Java, uh, which is an area where uh, no sustainable uh, logging is currently practiced for that species. So we can use uh, these types of DNA to verify uh, uh, the, the source of origin uh, of products uh, and also check claims um, uh, of importers. And finally, uh, 
in trying to get to uh, understand and know uh, the numbers of species. It's very easy to be able to generate DNA barcodes for a wide range uh, of plants and animals. Some of the first uh, uh, work uh, uh, in this area was actually undertaken on seawater to uh, describe the number of microbes that existed uh, in seawater using uh, large-scale next-generation uh, sequencing techniques. We can work out how many microbes, uh, small insects, uh, 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 fungi exist uh, in soil. One kilo of soil will contain millions of different species of microbes. So it's a whole ecosystem uh, in its own right. And we can use some rather unusual assistance to help collect some of the samples as well. We can actually uh, sample uh, the floor of an area by uh, uh, sampling uh, the guts of, of camels and uh, the dung uh, of camels. We can also work out where those camels uh, have been foraging, and we can use that to target control efforts uh, for feral uh, animals. And this is some work being undertaken uh, by Mike Wilkinson, uh, who recently arrived in Adelaide, um, where he was actually able to uh, capture bees that have been visiting uh, flowers in the field, comb the pollen uh, off those bees, and then DNA barcoded the pollen uh, from uh, those bees. And what you can get from that, you can get uh, an understanding of which plants the, uh, the, the bees visit. You get different species of bee visiting different plants. You actually get the males, of, males and females of the bees visiting uh, different plants. And over season, uh, they visit different plants uh, because different flowers uh, come into uh, flowering at that time. Also, with these types of studies, it's possible to identify very rare plants that are there within the landscape but you haven't picked up within your traditional ecological survey methods. And that's been done using uh, these types of techniques. So some of these uh, samples where you can get easily large environmental samples can be used for uh, biodiversity discovery uh, and documenting uh, missions. There's now quite an interest from the Australian government to invest time and resources to understand how our systems are changing. We've seen fragmentation uh, of uh, native communities, large number of invasive species coming in, and now climate change. We actually have very little data on how those systems are changing. And uh, we're establishing here in South Australia a, a transec to really monitor uh, some of those changes and how species are changing over time. We're using these types of DNA uh, barcoding techniques to go out into the field and measure uh, what biodiversity out is out there uh, and how it changes. That will be useful for measuring uh, how systems are changing into the future. But also what we have here uh, in South Australia are large numbers of museum collections. We can go back and we can sample uh, uh, old uh, plants, for example, 10, 20, 30 years old, and we can understand their genetic um, uh, context 10, 20, or 30 years uh, ago, which gives us a fantastic baseline of how these systems are changing uh, to date. But it's no use doing this type of scientific analysis if we don't get out there and we don't start uh, communicating what the issues are. As scientists, we need to be able to clearly state what's happened and what's changing uh, about our environment. We need to say climate change is here. Climate change is having an effect on all our ecosystems and biodiversity, and it is. And part of that uh, uh, engagement strategy is a process called citizen science, where uh, scientists are able to communicate uh, openly uh, about uh, the, the findings that are out there, but where people are able to participate in scientific endeavors, participate in the collection uh, of species. And Aldous Huxley said, uh, you know, you can only uh, uh, love what you know. And unless scientists are better at saying, well, these are the species that are out there. There are 10 million species. Let's get to know uh, some of those species. Let's find out what they, they are. There's no real value going on uh, for that biodiversity. And I think that's what it comes back to. We value uh, production of agriculture. We value industrial production. And soon, we're going to be valuing carbon as well. We need to value biodiversity. Thank you. <laughs>